recording. Ah, they switched up male homozygous with female wild type. Okay, yeah, we will look at that. So, um, in the box plot chart. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I did the assignments this morning since um, I have to redo them every every year because the databases update. And I also found that like there was something really hard to find, which used to be very easy to find on the website. So um, it's it's difficult, right? You make the assignments, um, and I I checked them quickly before, but. Um, Sometimes it's just that databases change. So, um, but we'll definitely look at that. Um, all right, let's start then. Um, I hope everyone's here. Um, so today, bioinformatics, we'll talk about DNA. So everything you wanted to know about DNA and perhaps a little bit more. Um, so let's make it an interesting lecture. If you have any questions, just throw them in chat and um, let's start. All right, so today this is the idea of what we're going to do. So we'll do the assignments from last week, of course, um, but for the overview of today, we will do a little bit of history of sequencing and history of DNA. Um, I will go into great detail about sequencing. So we will talk a lot about DNA sequencing, so about like things like alignment, um, but we will also talk about all of the things that are required uh, when you do DNA sequencing and, and which techniques there are or technologies there are. Um, we'll talk about genes since that's very closely related to DNA and how stuff is coded on the DNA. Um, so we'll talk about the structure of genes and how this is different from like bacteria and multicellular organisms. So the difference between um, transcription in prokaryotes and, um, and eukaryotes. Um, I will talk a little bit about transposons. I really love transposons. Barbara McClintock, the inventor of transposons, is one of my favorite scientists. Um, and um, I just like talking about transposons. Um, unfortunately, they're not that interesting when you talk about animals, but when you talk about plants, then transposons are, um, well, they, they matter a lot. So in plants, they're one of the main ways of generating variation in the DNA. Um, so we'll talk about transposons. We'll talk about regulatory elements briefly. There's a whole bunch of them, so I won't bore you with going through all 50 different types of uh, regulatory elements. Um, but I want to highlight some of them which are important. And um, we'll also talk about some other types of DNA. So um, mostly the mitochondria and the chloroplast, since it's, well, plants and animals. Um, as you can see, I've cleaned out part of the board because I'm going to need the board um, for the assignments today. Um, and we'll talk about biomarkers, although I might have dropped that because I was working on the presentation and I think we had a little bit too many slides. So I decided to drop a couple of slides and move some around. Um, Karo in Gurku. Karo, Karo, Guku? Welcome to the stream, Karo Ing Uku, <laughs> however you want to pronounce your name. Um, welcome, thanks for watching. Um, so these are the topics for today, um, but first, like promised, we will have uh, the answers to the, to the previous assignments. Um, so we'll just go through them uh, quickly, I hope. Um, so I think I should start with the phenotypic databases and then do the um, do the um, drawing of the of the different crosses, so the two-point cross and the three-point cross, um, so that that will take a little bit of time. Um, so, um, who was it? Testosaurus. Testosaurus 3K said that there was a, a, an, an error on the IMPC database. Um, so let's just switch to the IMPC database and see if that is correct. Um, let me switch to there. So here we see the IMPC database. Um, I'm on the about page, but so the first question was how many protein coding genes does a mouse have according to the IMPC database? Alexander, Alexander, welcome to the stream. Also hi to you. Thanks for watching. Um, so I was clicking around on the website and I found it this morning and then I wanted to kind of click on it again and, and show you where you can find it, but um, I, I couldn't. Um, I think I did something like search for PIC3CA because that's their kind of gene of the month. 
um, and then you get one gene um, but I clicked on it and I, I, I don't know exactly where I found the total number of genes um, in the IMPC database um, but um, I was looking at it and the funny thing was is that it actually changed um, since last year so last year when we did that uh, they say that there were 22,955 genes and when I checked this morning there were only 22,924 genes so I don't know exactly where I found that um, let me click on here and but I think I found it somewhere um, in, in, in their total number of genes I, I don't know. I, I clicked around, and, and but it's really, really hard to find. And it, it used to be very, very easy to find because you would go to just the, the homepage of IMPC and then it would say search all of the knocked out data. And then there was like this uh, total number of genes below. Um, but um, you can just search for mouse gene. All right, let's search for mouse gene. Just search for it. So then I get. 774 results. Oh, and the assembly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the assembly also didn't change from last year. So I found that really strange that they, they all of a sudden have like um, 31 genes less compared to uh, to to the other one. Yeah, I was clicking around this morning and, and um, it used to be a very simple question because uh, normally you would go about to about and, uh, oh no, you would go to data and then here they have the um, um, latest data release right and then you would click on the data release and then it would say the number total number of genes um, but now they only provide the summary so they only provide that there are 700 7022 um, that they that they clicked out yeah 22,924 commando that's that's right that's also the exact same number that I got and last year um, when I looked into the database there were 955 so 31 more uh, than there are currently but anyway um, it, it's clicking around and then then you find the answer um, of course if you if you probably click on this version then they might actually tell you how many genes there are and then you go to the Jack's website um, but it's it's interesting um, mutant mice <sighs> I know I found it this morning I was clicking around because I was answering all the questions and then uh, um, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit hidden somewhere um, but uh, I hope everyone was able to to find it there might actually be release notes where one of the older versions um, but uh, I I can't remember how I got there so I, I think that that's it used to be just in the top and they used to have like an overview as well so that you could like fold like in a in a in a in a tree structure but they don't provide that anymore and that's one of these things with databases um, just search without anything can you do that yeah that's it not fake. yeah that's it okay thank you commando like uh, kudos to you 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 found it if you just press search indeed then you get the total number of genes so 22,924 um, it used to be 31 more um, so of course um, question B was um, how many of the protein coding genes have been knocked out and have completed and have been completely phenotyped um, so that's um, that's just the number of here so it's 7022 knockout data um, so those are um, all the knockouts that they have um, and where there is phenotype data available um, you might actually be able to search for phenotype data available as well but that doesn't really bring up anything but it's just that if you go to genes then hey, it shows you here that there are 7022 um, that that are there all right so it's question B um, so the next one is how many genes are associated with respiratory diseases and have been completely phenotyped and this one used to be an interesting question because there was only like a couple of them um, but of course databases update every time um, so the idea here was just to search for respiratory so you go to phenotypes then you search for respiratory um, and then when you search for respiratory you can see that there are 26 different respiratory conditions that they have in the database and then it used to be that it would look like okay so there were four here and there were like five here so if you would add them all up there would just be a handful um, but now they're actually a lot more so you can see that hey, there are 61 
1 plus 123 plus 60 plus 51 and of course there's also some overlap between these um, but yeah, so how many genes are associated with respiratory diseases um, well there are 26 different uh, respiratory diseases um, and of course you can click on the individual phenotypes and then see which genes and how many genes so it already tells you that there are 35 genes um, which when knocked out would cause abnormal breathing patterns um, and um, so it, it changed a little bit um, but um, if you just add them up then you can see that most of them actually have no phenotype they are no genes associated with them um, but hey, you can kind of um, you, you can kind of add them up by hand um, so I didn't do that because it was just way too many um, but hey, um, the answer to this question that I, I answered it like this and said there's 26 phenotypes or diseases um, and a lot of genes in the database so of course this will change day to day so they might update the database in a week um, um, it's just that the question was there to get you guys to click a little bit on the database and to get familiar with how you can interact with it. All right, and then the D question. So question D was, um, what effect does all 13 gene knockout have on the fat mass of a mouse? So I actually got an email um, from someone asking, how can I look uh, at that? Um, so I sent an email back. Um, but I will just do it live for you guys. So we go to genes, um, then we search for AUG13. So you can see that AUG13, they produced ES cells, so embryonic stem cells, then they produced mice, and then they did phenotyping of this mice. Um, and then you can just click on the gene, then you get to the page which looks um, w w like here. And then the question was, is um, how does it affect um, body fat amount? Um, so we just go to uh, abnormal lean no we go to the abnormal adipose tissue amount um, so when we click on the adipose tissue amount um, it gives you an overview and here um, you see the different types so you have male wild type male homozygous and female wild type and indeed you're right so um, it might be worth actually sending them an email saying that their box plot is actually annotated wrongly um, because if you look here in the summary statistics of the data set you see that there are um, male controls and there are female controls and they have female homozygote knockouts go to the cursor on the box plot in the middle and on the right so observation you, you mean these ones go with the cursor on the box plot in the middle and on the right yeah so it says female wild type here which is which is also wrong because the female wild type is actually this one and this is female home so what I'm thinking that they're doing is they're just having male wild type male homozygous female wild type and so yeah there's there's something wrong because you can actually see here as well that here the overview is wrong as well right because here they have male controls which is which is okay then they have male controls again and this should be male homozygote and here you see female control and female homozygote so there is something strange in the in the page um, but if you if you scroll a little bit down um, then um, you can see actually here that it's it's again the table right but now you have the summary statistics so if you look into the summary statistics because we want to know right if the fat percentage goes up or goes down um, so we can see that in female controls the average fat is 0 0.21 if you have a homozygous knockout in females then they actually have 0 0.37 um, if I round up um, so you can see that female homozygous knockout mice have more fat than female control mice and then in the male control mice you see that males have more fat than, than females Um, okay, so the question from Testosaurus is, another question is this, that they accept only data when they tested seven mutant females and males, and why did they accept the data from this mutant when only seven female mutants were tested? Um, it might be that the um, knockout of this gene is lethal in humans, or in, uh, in, in males. So if the knockout is lethal in males, um, then that actually causes an issue, right? Because then no matter how hard you try, no males will be born 
Um, so um, then they will accept data because they, they try seven females and they si try seven males. Um, but if all of the males die during like gestation or when they are born or slightly after birth, uh, then of course there's no way to get phenotype data for them. So then hey, it will just be annotated as this mutation is homozygous lethal in males uh, and in females it's not lethal. It, it happens. Some some genes you can knock out in males and not in females and the other way around. Um, so I'm, I'm betting that they did make um, seven female mutants and seven male mutants, um, but I'm, I'm betting that the male mutants um, died um, prematurely um, or before they could test the phenotype. So the way that I answered the question was all 13, it's only tested in females, so seven, t uh, seven females, and it shows it an increase in total body fat um, when all 13 is knocked out. So it means that it goes from 0 0.37 um, or f it goes from 0 0.21 to 0 0.37. Um, so an interesting observation, uh, an interesting gene. It might be that it that it's lethal in males, um, but you also don't really get the um, the ideas that it might be lethal in males. But at least it might. I will put it on my to do list to at least send them an send them an email about the summary statistics page because it is it is it is strange that that the the categories are wrong. Um, especially when you hoover over them, right? This is male wild type, that's correct. Then here you see female wild type, so the, 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 the thing that pops up is, is correct. Um, it's just that the legend here is wrong um, for, for some reason. Um, so summary statistics, I am PC, send email. Um, I think that's, that's worth it, but... Uh, all right, so those were the first like quick look in IMPC. Um, so the next question was, um, uh, imagine that you have measured heart weight in a knockout mouse model. How many animals should you measure at the bare minimum before you can submit the data? And uh, we already had the answer to that. So you have to genotype or you have to phenotype seven males and seven females. Um, and then the B question was, is it easy to contribute your own information back into the database? And it is not easy. Like finding the information on how to contribute is very well hidden in the website. So you have to click on a lot of like open and how do I join and then you have to be a, a collaborator. Um, so it is, it is getting harder and harder to join the IMPC project and to submit your, your own data. Um, so the, the, the answer that I had, no, it's not easy. Information is very hard to find. And currently you have to become a partner first. So you have to first like submit all kinds of paperwork. Um, yeah, and you need to follow the protocol that they provide. Yeah, they have a very extensive phenotyping protocol. protocol so they have a whole pipeline of, of how you should kind of um, test your mice at which day you can do which experiment um, and it's it's a very extensive thing so um, they have a lot of partners and all of these partners have set up this phenotyping pipeline um, but becoming a part of the IMPC is, is really really hard um, which in a way is a good thing um, it is also a bad thing right there's a lot of people making knockouts um, so it would be better if everyone could submit it back on the other hand the data is really nice and clean um, because well they they only accept data from very well vetted partners um, so if you want to know wh who the partners are you can actually scroll down and then see the different centers that are uh, uh, contributing uh, when you uh, when you look at the phenotype overview so just a couple of questions for IMPC and um, remember it's it's one of the databases that is out there so there's the exact same database more or less for yeast so if you're interested in yeast and um, the guys in yeast actually did all of the knockouts already so they knocked out I think 18,000 genes in, in yeast um, and they are now doing like double mutants. So they are taking the individual knockouts that they made and then they are crossing them so t to get individuals who have two genes knocked out um, to see what the interactions between genes do. do. So um, very, very interesting. All right, so then the next questions were about um, 
uh, the OMIM database. Um, so the OMIM database is a really, really good database um, when you are interested in Mendelian diseases. Um, so let's switch to the ONIM database. So in this case, we uh, the question was what causes green color blindness? So we can just search for green color blindness. Oh, like this. Um, and then um, the first hit that comes up is uh, color blindness and it's called the Deutron series. Um, so if you click on it, then it actually says green color blindness. So the green color blindness is caused by a certain gene or a certain locus. And this gene is called OPN1MW. Um, and it's located on chromosome X. So you can click on it and see exactly where it is located. Um, and uh, it has a certain inheritance pattern, of course. Um, so it's X length inheritance. Um, and it has a certain ONIM number. Um, but and you can then have a whole bunch of overviews. So had the first time that it was described is in 1968. Um, so and that's what I like. They give you a lot of background information on your phenotype. Um, and um, um, it's it's just a very good database and of course hey if you just search for color blindness you get a lot more um, hey, so you get like uh, the the other color blindness which is uh, being um, insensitive to red um, so red color blindness which is called protopanopia proton it's a it's proton um, so it's um, a good database uh, to find things like color blindness, earwax, um, and whatever Mendelian diseases there are. So if you ever in the future want to study a disease or need to study a disease, um, then it's definitely worth throwing the disease in the OMIM, o OMIM database. All right, so then the question B was, so 3B was, has this gene been phenotyped in the IMPC database? Um, so um, I think it was not. Let me look at the answers that I did. Um, no, um, it hasn't been genotyped yet, so we can actually search for the gene. Um, so if we search for the gene, then we see that it has not been studied yet, um, but there have been embryonic stem cells produced. So they do have embryonic stem cells, which have the mutation. Um, so the next step for them would be uh, is to implant the, these em or to kind of generate mice using this embryonic stem cells. And then of course, when they have seven males and seven females born, then they will go through the phenotyping pipeline. Um, and again, here you can actually see that uh, there's a green cone opsin or green long wavelength sensitivity cone. And so, so they already know what this gene is annotated as, but it's just that they haven't been able to knock it out. And of course, there might be other phenotypes associated when you knock out this gene. Um, but and they are working on it, um, but currently um, there's only embryonic stem cells which have been produced with the knockout, um, so they still need to generate mice, and then these mice still need to go through the phenotyping pipeline. All right, so then back to the in more interesting question, or more interesting question, to the questions about Mendelian maps and Mendelian phenotypes. Um, so I'm going to close Firefox. Um, and then um, I'm just going to draw them, right? Because that was the question. So the first question is, draw the Mendelian inheritance diagram for two traits in an AABB versus AABB cross. Um, so and the question here is, is how do we write it down? So of course, when we do a Mendelian inheritance diagram, and we, we just want to do something like this. Um, so um, Let's start with the easy one and then just say, well, we have a parent, which is AABB. So of course, this parent can generate only one type of um, one type of zygote. So of course, every every zygote or every um, sperm cell or egg cell produced will have the AB genotype. So um, I hope people can see that. I can actually zoom in a little bit. I think, uh, if I move back a little bit, then it would be uh, would be possible, right? So if I have an individual which is AABB, uh, then of course the only kind of um, sperm cell or, or egg cell which can be produced is AB, um, because you get one A and a B, or but you always get the smaller variant. All right, so the next is an individual which is AA and B. B. So of course here there are multiple possibilities to be produced. Um, so we can produce um, big A, big B. We can have 
big A, small b, we can have small a, big b, and we can have small a, small b. All right, so then we can just write down the inheritance diagram, right? So in this case, we would have a big A, small a, um, big B, small b. For the next one, we would have a, a big A, small a, two small b's, and we would have a a, so two small a's, one small b, and one big b. And then in the last situation, we would have the same as what we had back, so we would get an a a and a b b. So now the first thing that we then want to do is to identify which are the parental genotypes. So have these individuals or individuals that have this genotype are no different from this parent. And then of course we want to identify the other. So this other parental strain um, has these genotypes. So if we want to calculate the distance between these two genes, um, then we count the number of offspring which are in these two groups, right? So imagine that we produce 500 offspring and a hundred of them show a recombination, so, so they, they have a different genotype. And so that means that now a hundred out of 500 animals are recombinant, meaning that the distance is uh, one in five, uh, which is 20%, which is 20 map units, which is 20 centimorgan. All right, is that clear? I, I think so, right? This is just a very um, um, interesting, or it's not a, it, it's a very basic cross. Um, so I hope that everyone is able to make this cross um, because hey, you can see that there are four different um, possible offspring. Um, and of course, head here is the AABB. So this is the homozygous parent. And of course, the homozygous parent can only provide one um, um, one different uh, gamete, while the heterozygous parent can produce four different gametes. So now the question becomes, why do we use a homozygous parent and why don't we take, so question 1b was, why don't we take two heterozygous animals? Um, and of course the, the answer to that is then we would have four possible gametes from this parent as well. So we would end up with 16 different situations. Um, so we would just have to generate much, much more offspring to get um, the, the, the distance, right? Because if we have 16 categories, and then many of these categories will be parental-like, some of the categories will not be parental-like. Um, but the, the idea is, is to make the easiest crossing scheme, uh, which will allow us to do the calculation on the distance between these two genes. Um, so I hope that's clear. Like, hey, otherwise, if we have, would have had four possibilities here as well, we would have 16 answers. And of course, hey, it's if you now generate in individuals, hey, then of course, 500 individuals scattered across four categories is of course better than 500 individuals scattered across 16 categories, because you just have more individuals for each of the categories. All right, so that was the first one. So this is a very easy two point cross. Um, let me get some oh, stuck with my microphone. All right, so let me clear out the board. And then we will do the other one. So the other one is more interesting and a lot more difficult to draw because I'm probably going to mess it up. So I'm going to make sure that the board is relatively clean. And the way that we do it is now we have the same cross as that we had before, but we now have three genes or three alleles that we're trying to track. All right, so then I'm thinking that the best way to do it is to switch around because like the board is a little bit longer than it is wide. All right, so we have one parent which is A, A, B, B, and C, C. So of course this parent also just generates one single gamete and the single gamete that it generates is a small A, a small B, and a small C. All right, so now we have the other parent. So the other parent is big A, small A, big B, small B, big C, small C. All right, so now it becomes a little bit more difficult and I like to start from the small ones, right? So what you can inherit is a small A, small B, 
small c. Right, so this is the first possibility, and of course we just get the original parent back, a, a, b, b, c, c, all small. All right, so then the next one that we can do is we can inherit a big A, a small b, and a small c. So the offspring would look like this. The next one would be we get a big A, a big B, and a small c. The offspring would look like this. We can inherit, of course, a big A, a small b, and a big C, so then the offspring would look like this. Alright, and now it's getting tricky because now I'm having to deal with the duplicates, so, and I'm doing this by head, and people always tell you to never do a live demo, so never do this live. So then the next one that, that is a possibility is of course a small a, a big B, and a small c. So then the offspring would look a a, big B, small b, small c, small c. Alright, then the next one would be a, big B, big C. So then we would have the offspring being a, a, b, b, and big C, small c. Alright, so we're almost there. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Alright, so then the last one that I'm thinking at is actually a small a, a small b and a big C, the offspring would look like this. And then the last one is of course everything big, big A, big B and big C, and then it would be A, A, B, B and C, C. Alright, then we define the two parental genotypes, so these animals have not recombined, right, because they are similar, and then of course we have the same thing here for this one and this one. All right, question in the chat, Super Hamburger, do you think biotechnology should be used to greatly modify or enhance humans? Pooh, that's a difficult question. Um, I would say no. Um, biotechnologies have a lot of power and they can do a lot, um, but biotechnologies in general should be applied in an ethical way or um, at least like I, I don't know exactly what you what you th yeah if, if you're thinking about cyberpunk or these kinds of things but um, I think that biotechnology will make our life in future a lot easier and it will help us deal with a lot of things like climate change yeah, because the more food you can produce from a, um, a, a meter um, and the, the less water that you use um, and these things will of course greatly enhance our lives and, and make it so that we can kind of reduce our footprint on, on, on the world. Um, but I am very I'm very undecided if we should apply that to humans. And of course we already do that, right? Like we already do in some countries do prenatal screening. Um, so have, for example, if, if you nowadays get pregnant and you go to the doctor, then the doctor can tell you if your child will have like Down syndrome or, um, or other like inherited defects. Um, so it will, it will help us in a great way, um, but it will also be very, it, it, like every technology, you can use it for good and you can use it for bad. Um, so, but uh, I think that like every step of the way, you should kind of stand still, realize what you've done and see what the effects of it will be. All right. Anyway, going back to the assignment, assignment number two, um, draw the inheritance diagram. So this is the nice inheritance diagram. I think it's a bit blurry. I don't know. Perhaps if I go out of frame, then the camera will focus on the inheritance diagram. Um, and then question number two, how many different gametes can be produced from the A, B, 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 and C, C parent? Of course, those are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, which is of course two to the power of three. And of course, when you would have four gametes, you would have two to the power of four. Um, so it, it kind of follows a really nice um, kind of computer strategy, right? So computers also work with like two to the power of something. And here it's the same thing. You have two to the power of three. Um, so if you would have four different gametes, you would go to two to the power of four. 
All right, so those were the assignments for uh, for today, um, or f actually from last week, since we're discussing them now. I hope everyone was able to uh, draw the three-point inheritance diagram. Um, a lot of times people forget a couple, and the way that I actually like to write them down is just go one by one, right? So you just write down the first one, all of them small, then make the first one big, first and second one big, first and third one big. So kind of do like binary counting um, on the on the answers. All right, so let's switch back to the lecture layout, and those were the um, the answers to the previous assignment. All right, so I need to be able to click on that as well. So, are there any more questions about the? Uh, if not, then let's continue. All right, so lecture for today. I'm just looking at the clock I've been recording yeah that's okay fine all right so first again like I like to start my lecture by having you guys think a little bit and put something in the chat about what you think um, so the question here is like we're like you're all biology students right so you should be able to tell me what the four biochemical parts of life are so if I am building a living organism um, there are four biochemical parts that I definitely need um, and which are more or less essential for life as we know it. Um, so just throw your answers in the chat and then I will write them down and then we will see what the answer is. So who wants to start the four biochemical parts of life? Go. Oxidation. Oxida that, that I'm actually looking at like um, nucleic acids, very good Testosaurus, yeah, nucleic acids is definitely one. What do you mean by oxidation, by the way? Is that like the oxidation? Fats, fats and proteins, all right, nucleic acid, fats and proteins. Hydrolysis, now I'm not really looking for like um, um, so if you build a living creature, right? So if you take a cell, then this cell is made up of different um, molecules. And these molecules, they fall into four biochemical parts in a way. And so one of the things which is correct is nucleic acids, right? So you need nucleic acids to build a living creature, like be it DNA or be it RNA. Water. Water seems to be a very, um, yeah, you probably need that. Polysaccharides, yeah, yeah, that's the that's the last one. So water, um, interesting. Yeah, it's generally like I'm, when you're talking about biomolecules, then water is not generally considered a biomolecule. But uh, no, you guys are you 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 already have all of them. So um, the real four parts of life, or more or less the parts of life that you need, is um, proteins to as effector molecules, lipids to kind of protect or make a, make a distinction between the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell. Um, polysaccharides are very, very important because they determine how proteins work. So they are more or less connected to proteins, but also um, DNA is, is made up of polysaccharides. Um, and of course you need nucleic acids, so DNA and RNA. Um, Although, although, Alexander, I do like your idea of adding water to the list, because without water there's no real life. And of course, like for most of these things, you also need things like iron or copper or you know, real like metals. Um, but generally the metals are not really considered, because metals are not biochemistry, so they, they kind of fall underneath standard chemistry. Um, but he, the, the classical definition of the four biochemical parts of life um, is nucleic acids, lipids, proteins, and polysaccharides, so um, to have uh, um, sugars. All right, so thank you for the participation and the different answers. Um, oxidation was an interesting one because it's a, it's a biological process, but of course like oxidation is like fire oxidizes as well in a way, so it's it's a little bit iffy. Um, but the, the standard classical definition is 
four biochemical parts of life, proteins, lipids, um, sugars, and nucleic acids. So today, of course, we will be talking about DNA. So the, the whole lecture will be about DNA. Um, and next week we'll, be, we'll have a whole lecture about RNA and then the week after we will have a whole lecture about proteins and had, uh, not so much about DNA, RNA and proteins because I have assumed that you kind of know what a DNA molecule is um, but more about how bioinformatics relates to this and especially today we will be talking about DNA so DNA sequencing um, will be kind of one of the fundamental um, processes that we will describe. All right, so and like I said, we will be talking about DNA and DNA sequencing. So DNA sequencing, the definition is, is that it is the process of determining the order of the nucleotides. So the four different nucleotides that we have in DNA, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine um, within a DNA molecule. And so that's what we mean when we talk about DNA sequencing is just determining the order. So which comes first, which is second, which is third, and um, which is next. But before we can start about DNA, talking about DNA sequencing, what do we use sequencing for? Well, sequencing nowadays is used like almost everywhere. Um, and it is especially, it's especially, it's a lot used in things like diagnostics at the moment. So nowadays when um, you go to the hospital and there's something well, not so much wrong with you, but then you, you have a disease, um, then people draw blood and based on your own DNA profile, they might do some, they, they might sequence your whole genome or they might sequence part of your genomes to help them using diagnostics. And so if you go to the hospital and you have uh, breast cancer, um, then they will take a little biopt of you. Um, so they will take a little bit of blood or, or a little bit of tissue. They will sequence the tissue and then they will look to see if you have the uh, BRCA2 gene because they know that mutations in BRC2 uh, are one of the main causes, I think like in 40% of um, breast tumors, um, BRCA2 is mutated. Um, so if they know that this gene is mutated, then they can adjust um, your treatment based on that. Um, biotechnology, hey, also there, sequencing is used a lot. Um, so hey, if you're thinking about biotechnology, like making new uh, new plants or animals or these kinds of things, um, then of course head sequencing is one of the fundamental techniques that people use. Um, forensic biology, forensic biology, then I'm thinking about like the police when there's a dead body on the ground somewhere, then the police comes in and they, they swab all of the different spots or if they find a hammer um, and next to the dead body then they will try to extract DNA from that and then they will make a DNA profile and then using these DNA profile they will try and find the, the, the perpetrator for the crime. Um, so forensic biology sequencing is used more and more. Um, it used to be that it used, used to be standard cutting enzymes so they would cut the DNA into using several cutting enzymes and then make a profile. Um, but nowadays sequencing also in forensic biology is getting more and more um, the norm um, because hey, using cutting enzymes is relatively quick and cheap, um, but sequencing is getting cheaper and cheaper every, every month. Um, so it's used more and more also in forensic biology. And of course, virology nowadays, um, I checked last week and if you think about the SARS coronavirus, the novel coronavirus, which is out there, um, then currently we have 38,000 um, genomes of this virus sequenced. So one of the things that, of course, it was the, the main um, thing that happened is in, in uh, just after the outbreak, happened um, in January the genome sequence of this of this virus was published um, but if you look from from January when the first sequence was published up until now so like like 11 months later um, 38,000 versions or not so much different versions because they sequenced 38,000 um, extracts from from patients all across the world to kind of keep track of um, how the virus is mutating and how these different uh, mutations are spreading throughout the population and so that you can do more or less a track and trace of how this virus is moving across the world and how this virus is mutating. Um, so um, one of my um, favorite 
website where they, they show this is the uh, next strain website. So the next strain um, is, is showing uh, these uh, mutations um, and um, I will I will just show you the website right since we're sitting here and I, I do love their website. Um, so so here you see all of the uh, genetic epidemiology of the novel coronavirus. Um, so how, what they do is they, they build this tree of inheritance. So here you see the first kind of reference sequence and then here all these little dots are individual virus extracts from patients that have been sequenced and so it is kind of a mixture between forensic biology in a way because they're trying to track where the virus comes from um, but the nice thing is is also that they that they have like they, they visualize how these things um, um, work um, no I don't want so if you would play the the then head they would start at the, at the beginning of the outbreak and then you see the virus moving around um, and head they it doesn't really show quite well here, but if you would zoom in, um, they would also have little, um, let me see, they have normally little um, little lines between the different sequence genomes. Um, perhaps I shouldn't show it by region then, but I should show it by, um, so don't color it by region, but um, color it by, for example, an amino acid. Um, so let me see, it's a really nice website, so when we look at the spike protein, and this is one of the main uh, nucleotides, so color it by that one, and then we now see that if you look at the strain right uh, here at the top, then you see that the original strain, and then you see this European mutation that everyone's talking about. So hey, everyone's talking about the new mutation this is not the mink mutation which has recently been discovered but this is the mutation that occurred in uh, Bavaria uh, slash Italy um, more or less beginning of February and then when you look at that and you would um, reset the map then uh, and we would zoom out a little bit and then you can see here across oh that's way too much so here across the world map you can you can see now what the distribution is of the blue one so the original virus um, and you can see the, the 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 new variant of the virus so when you when you play right then you see that originally we only had the blue virus um, but then all of a sudden you see the new variant of the virus pop up in Finland and Germany and also uh, in, uh, in in Italy and you see that that this virus is based on this single mutation you can more or less track and trace uh, where or how the virus spread and, and where it comes from so um, just something I wanted to show you um, but it is a main main thing of, of bioinformatics is making these databases and of course sequencing is key to virology at the moment if you want to uh, trace an outbreak um, and then of course what you're doing is you're taking material from patients you're sequencing it you're looking at individual mutations and you look to see um, hey, how you can trace those back and nowadays in virology uh, you can for example also determine if um, hey, if a certain Ebola outbreak how that how that goes and how the how people kind of spread the virus around so very interesting and it's becoming more and more of the norm is to sequence every virus that comes in so everyone who comes into the hospital they take some of your nasal swab and they can then sequence the virus um, and, and look which mutations are there and how these mutations are, are spreading all right, so when we talk about DNA and DNA sequencing, we, we have to talk a little bit about terminology. And um, the first thing that I want to talk about is that everything in, in sequencing that we do, we talk about the reference sequence. So um, also when you look at SARS-CoV-2, like the Chinese published uh, the sequence in uh, beginning of January, and this sequence is the reference sequence. So when people sequence a new individual or a new virus, um, they, are, they are sequencing the individual, but then they always report sequences relative to the reference sequence. Because otherwise you have to always, hey, in humans we have two billion base pairs, and so you would have to write down two billion base pairs, um, but you could also write down just the differences because generally the differences are not that much so by writing down the differences you you save a lot of 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 of, uh, of space by by storing it um, so and these differences we call variants so dna variants 
um, come into two different formats. One of them is an SNP, so a single nucleotide polymorphism, which you see like depicted here, right? So imagine that this is the reference strain, and then the reference strain at a certain position might have an A, um, and then you sequence two more individuals, and some individuals have a G at this position, and other individuals have a T. Right, so here we have a, a single nucleotide polymorphism, so a single base pair in the genome, um, which is different um, from this individual towards the reference sequence. So single nucleotide polymorphisms, the same as inserts and deletions, so indels, so small parts of the genome which have been deleted or uh, where you have an insert of a couple of base pairs, they are always kind of annotated relative to the reference. So the reference, yeah, the, there's a single human genome reference sequence. So, and, and that human that has been sequenced is Greg Fenter. So if you get your, more or less your, your, um, your genome sequenced, uh, then you get in the end the positions of your genome which are different from the ones from Greg Fenter. So the, the, the guy um, who in who was involved in the in the human genome project. So everything is relative. So when we talk about DNA sequencing, we usually talk about reads, and DNA sequencing reads um, are base pairs and the quality of each of these base pairs. So hey, the, the read could, for example, be all of the all of the sequence here. So uh, G C A G C G T T A G A, and that is the that is the read, so this is something that a sequencer might produce, but a sequencer also produces a quality score. So it will say that, well, I was, um, the, the chances of this G being wrong is one in a thousand. The chances of this C being wrong is one in 10,000. And the chances of the A being wrong is one in a hundred. So when we talk about a DNA sequencing read, we talk about a, a string of letters and associated with this string of letters are quality scores. So how confident are we that these letters are correct? And then we talk about DNA alignment a lot. So alignment is matching these reads towards the reference sequence. So what we do is we get a read from a sequencer and then we just scan across the reference genome to see where this read fits best. Um, and of course, had we then take into account the quality of each base pair. And if there's a one in five chance that a certain base pair is wrong, then we of course penalize less um, when there's a mismatch to the reference compared to uh, the whole, uh, to compared to a base pair where there's a one in 10,000 um, chance of being wrong. And so reads, base pairs, and the quality of these base pairs, um, and the alignment is the process of matching reads to the reference genome. All right, so I think we should take a short break. Um, we've been going at it for like 55 minutes um, and I want to do a quick cigarette. Um, so we will be back in at 3.05. 3 so I will be back at 3.05 and, and we will continue then. Um, and then hey, we will talk about the history. So I will see you in um, around 10 minutes and I will then stop the recording.